Hi, I'm David Marchant, the founder of Offshore Alert, which investigates participants in high value cross-border finance with an emphasis on high confidentiality jurisdictions. Our specialty is exposing investment fraud while it's in progress. Enjoy our content. Good morning. Uh, let me introduce myself and this session. My name is Warren Gluck and I'm a partner at Holland and Knight. Uh, as many uh, of David's viewers will know that I've been participating in the live offshore alert conferences now for many, many years. I've, I've lost count. And we have always tried to do interesting panels on a range of subject matters, uh, both practical and legal, that relate to either offshore litigation, uh, offshore claims. This year, David and I began discussing uh, one of the premises for this conference, which uh, I'll read a Wall Street Journal quote from 2009 about what Offshore Alert is. Uh, it's, quote, it's like that famous bar in Star Wars where they all come together. The good guys, the bad guys, the seriously guilty, and they all exchange information on neutral territory. And obviously nobody's a bad guy here or any, or any guilty, but the aim of exchanging information on neutral territory is the aim of this session. And this session is about the interaction between offshore liquidators, office holders, receivers, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, and its fiduciaries, officers, and receivers in the United States. What we all know is that sometimes things can work well, and sometimes there's at least the ability and propensity for conflict. What we have tried to do is create a forum here today where we have an offshore liquidator. I'll let them, of course, introduce themselves, Mr. Egal Wiseman, and the SEC's head of bankruptcy enforcement, uh, Ms. Alastair Bombach, who's ultimately responsible for appointing and supervising SEC receivers. Uh, and we are intending to discuss some of the more uh, problematic issues, some of the inherent issues that are associated with multi-jurisdictional uh, asset recovery endeavors, particularly in circumstances of fraud. And we are also going to try and discuss some of the ways that these issues can be addressed, can be avoided, can be snuffed out before they start, and things of that nature. So without further ado, let me first introduce Ms. Alastair Bombach. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, just a very short um, introduction to who I am and what I do. Um, I am the Chief Bankruptcy Counsel for the Division of Enforcement for the Securities and Exchange Commission. I have been responsible for bankruptcy litigation and enforcement matters involving bankruptcy cases since 2006. Uh, one of my major responsibilities is the oversight of our equity receivership program, uh, our, the appointment of corporate monitors, and the oversight of bankruptcy cases where trustees and foreign insolvency liquidators have been appointed by courts. Um, I, in this role, I, I work with the enforcement staff to structure um, settlements, to structure litigation plans, to make recommendations about suing overseas entities. Um, I advise on settling uh, cross-border disputes, and I am also responsible for determining whether or not to seek to enforce SEC injunctions, asset freezes, and judgments in foreign jurisdictions. Um, and some of the major cases I've worked on throughout my career, in, in addition to WorldCom and Adelphia, I've worked on a number of cross-border matters involving uh, the um, late trading and market timing cases um, and other matters involving foreign bankruptcy cases. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Wiseman. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to my co-panelists. Uh, great to be here. Actually, I was I was talking with my co-panelists a little earlier. I'm so happy to wear a suit. I haven't worn one in, in, in eight months now. So uh, thanks for allowing me to do that today. 
Uh, basically, my name is Egal Wiseman. I'm a partner at, at Ernst & Young. I'm, I'm originally from, from Canada. Uh, I spent most of my time in, in Montreal and Toronto on large uh, bankruptcy and insolvency restructuring matters. I'm a licensed, Canadian licensed insolvency trustee. And about five years ago, I moved uh, here to the Caribbean. I'm based in the Bahamas physically, but we work in our region collectively with my partners um, in other Caribbean regions in what we call the BBC, uh, and it's uh, the Bahamas, uh, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and the British Virgin Islands. And we, uh, we take appointments as liquidators, receivers. Uh, we work very often closely with the local regulators. We, of course, have dealings with the US SEC and other uh, regulators across the globe. So again, great to be here this morning. Great to see you all. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both. Now, what I'm going to try to do is, is, is uh, moderate the flow of this discussion so we can provide the audience with who are, for, some are lay and some are, of course, experienced practitioners, just a little sense of what's going on here and why it is that we're having a discussion like this. Uh, the, the premise is that uh, in, in case, not in all cases of insolvency, but in cases of insolvency that relate to fraud and relate to uh, a United States financial institution or securities, there is a natural overlap of jurisdiction. It makes perfect sense. If there is a fraud, if there is a financial fraud, a hedge fund blow up, uh, we live in a world where it is perfectly appropriate and permissible for funds to be incorporated in the Bahamas, in the Cayman Islands, in other offshore jurisdictions. And the funds are, of course, formed under the laws of those jurisdictions. Typically, investors will be some combination of United States and non-United States foreign investors. Same thing with creditors. And they will often assume that their rights are going to be governed within the confines of the, the place of incorporation. Yet, those funds engage in business in the United States. They raise in money from investors in the United States. They hold assets in the United States and maybe even are their, their primary assets in the United States. When there is a major problem, therefore, it is sensible and would, it, is, it, it makes sense that there would be multiple governments and their organs involved in the cleanup effort. And what we are talking about here is a situation where there are a few formats for those proceedings. And often they will occur in parallel. So for example, in the case of a serious bank fraud or a financial fraud, there may be SEC proceedings. It may be that the SEC appoints a receiver over the United States assets, or it's sometimes even broader. But there will also typically be liquidation proceedings that may be triggered by the very fact that there are SEC receivership proceedings involving a loss of control. There may have been a pre-existing uh, liquidation proceeding, which of course is also a governmental function. It's simply the judiciary of each jurisdiction appointing a court officer over a bankruptcy. There's nothing controversial about it. It is often the case that bankruptcy proceedings, there will be a liquidity problem before the fraud becomes exposed. So there will be a pre-existing bankruptcy proceeding. The question we're going to try to deal with here, and the first question I would like to pose is, as a general proposition, Alastair and Egal, how do you find the communication to be at the governmental level, the agency level between the United States and the various offshore jurisdictions? Let me start, Warren. Um, there's, there's two components to that. The first is that we have a formal process, which people may or may not be aware of, but internally, when the staff is working on an enforcement case um, and there's a foreign jurisdiction involved, we're not allowed to just get on the phone with our foreign counterparts or in some instances. Um, we have to go through our Office of International Affairs. There might very well be an MLAT or an MOU or some kind of a informal process governing the relations. And so we have to go through 
what I call the internal diplomatic process first. Um, that having been said, um, once we go through that diplomatic hurdle um, and we speak directly to foreign regulators, um, our relationship generally is quite good. Um, a lot of times we speak to them about what our jurisdiction goals and aims are. They speak with us about what they view their um, mandate to be. And then with that in mind, we then look to see whether or not there's a, uh, a liquidator or an administrator appointed. And um, we then get the, get the approval to reach out to them um, on a staff basis and can commence negotiations or decide our next steps. So while it is sometimes a little bit of a cumbersome process, uh, I'd say um, at least with the regulators, there's a free flow of information uh, and with rare exception, um, a, a joint effort to try to work together to get money back to say defrauded investors and honor each country's separate laws. I hope that kind of is helpful. I, I think I think it very much is, Egal. Yeah, you know, in, in my experience, I mean, certainly there has been a lot of cooperation um, between the regulators, the US SEC and, and the, the offshore regulators. I know that a lot of our regulators here in the Caribbean region are part of the uh, International Organization of Securities Commissions, IOSCO, and there is a free-flowing uh, information between the regulators. And, and often when there is a liquidation or receivership or some sort of enforcement that involves the local regulator and the U.S. regulator, and we typically find that there is a even better cooperation because the regulators are typically, most of the time, not always, but they're most of the time try to be aligned. And then when there is a, 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 um, an offshore liquidator that comes into the picture, and it, it, it creates a, a better balance and uh, it helps align the interests of the, the different parties. That's, I think that's, that's, that's very helpful. And then I guess now we're going to get into the practical element. So there is a matter which has attracted attention of at least two regulatory bodies, SEC, perhaps the Bahamas regulator, uh, and, and uh, there is also a decision to make as to whether a liquidator or receiver is going to be appointed in the offshore jurisdiction in which the fund is incorporated and a decision to be made as to whether the SEC is going to seek the appointment of its own receiver in the United States. This is where potentially there is the, 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 the ability to have jurisdictional overlap. Of course, with jurisdictional overlap comes conflicts. So let's begin with, in terms of the aims of the SEC with its receiver and versus what is typically a liquidator in the offshore jurisdiction. It's not always, it could be an administrator appointed directly by the regulator, but typically there is a liquidator or it becomes a liquidation after a, uh, an administration. What are the typically the aims of the SEC and the aims of a liquidator and how do they, uh, how do they complement each other and how do they uh, sometimes conflict? Okay, um, Warren, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the SEC, when we are confronted with a potential foreign defendant um, that is in the process of or likely to file an insolvency proceeding of some type, um, our goals are very much the same as they would be if that was going to be happening in the United States. So our goals primarily in the first instance would be to ensure that um, money was not being diverted or concealed uh, either domestically or foreign in a foreign context. We would want to try to get some financial reporting if it was an entity, in other words, an accounting perhaps. Um, we would want to make sure that there was an investigation of or a method in place to recover assets that might have been transferred in the name of, for example, um, 
fraudulent conveyancing or conveyancing from individual defendants or an entity to related parties. Um, and we would want um, under the pretty well established case law in the appellate courts in the US to um, ensure that there would be enough funds available to either pay a penalty or disgorgement judgment. So our initial aims would be stop the bleeding, um, obviously, and um, we would want, if if there's a criminal interest, we would want border watches and things like that to make sure that funds and individuals didn't um, uh, try to sort of escape the United States, among other things. So those are our initial goals going in. Typically, our when we seek emergency relief in cases, which I would say is probably about 60% of our cases. That's just a rough guess. We seek asset freezes. We seek a temporary restraining order. We seek preliminary injunctions. Um, and if if the company um, is pervasive, if the fraud is pervasive, or if there's a lack of management, or if there's a very unique fact that requires immediate um, installation of a fiduciary to fully replace management, we will seek the appointment of an equity receiver in the United States District Court to supplant management um, and to become uh, the fiduciary overseeing the operations and liquidation of that entity. Um, so that is that is what we will do. Um, I think the first part of your question is what are your goals and aims? I think the second part of your question, you might want to restate how you want me to continue. No, no I think the goals and aims is, is, is a very good point. And, and, and I, what I'll, I'll turn to Egal with now is that's, I think you've been presented with the fir perfect fact pattern for your next answer, which is okay. there is a receiver or an injunction in place, Egal, and that receiver, let's assume for the moment that that receiver or injunction applies within the territorial United States. Uh, we are, we are going to have a, a discussion here about whether th th those injunctions are in fact, in practice, and legally uh, broader. But, okay, uh, let's assume yes. that he has made a decision to appoint a fiduciary, but at the same time, either administratively or via credit or process, uh, you have been contacted to serve in the exact in, in, in the same role, which is to displace management and uh, operate the wind down of the company, uh, make sure there are no fraudulent transfers, collect assets. Uh, so how do you then approach the situation? Yeah, look, it's a uh, it's a situation that happens a lot, right? I mean, it, it, there, there's a few cases we can talk about that or the same situation has been happening. I think, you know, um, we'll, we'll defer the question on what happens where there's, uh, you know, worldwide injunctions and how, how do we conduct ourselves when, 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 we, we're, when we're aware of such. But um, if we're aware that there's a U.S. Um, receiver or bankruptcy trustee, um, you know, one of the first orders of business is, is really to have a, a collaborative effort and, and communication protocol set up with that foreign officer, foreign to us, but uh, onshore. Uh, for, for the U.S. and most of the times it, it works quite well. You know, we have a case um, which I can't um, I can't talk about in, in particular detail. Uh, we have a case where um, the U.S. SEC was involved. Uh, there was an SEC um, um, receiver, and uh, you know, before COVID times, we were able to get on the plane and, and, and meet face to face, which I think was very helpful. Obviously, the virtual world has been has been great. There's been great advances in the, in virtual meetings, but the face-to-face -face has, has helped tremendously in our past engagements, meeting directly with the SEC, meeting directly with uh, SEC receivers or bankruptcy trustee, explaining what our interests are, explaining what our uh, protocols would like to be, communication protocols, um, how cash has to be managed, where the assets are, you know, what assets are onshore, what assets are offshore, essentially aligning our interests. There are going to be certain points of friction or tension at some point in time, maybe around the distribution waterfall, who has the right to certain assets. But ideally, um, we try to push those issues to, to a bit of a later date and at least set up some sort of working arrangement with that, that officer uh, in the U.S. It's, uh, it's you know, relationship and trust. We're all, we're all in it for the same interest, right? And the common goal is to maximize uh, investor and creditor uh, 
uh, collections. Perfect. I think that's an exact segue for the for my. You, you must have known my next question, which is, okay. So I I, I think that those are perfect setups where there has been a serious issue. Uh, the 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 institution, the financial institution, the funds have material United States interests. There are material liquidity problems necessitating the, the uh, involvement of an insolvency practitioner. There's material fraud necessitating the involvement of regulators, uh, or perhaps, perhaps even the criminal authorities. Um, how do you build the trust between entities. I'm, I, I think the litigation records, I don't think it's it's appropriate or fair to really focus on any particular case, but there obviously has been reported high profile liquid litigation sometimes between an offshore liquidator and SEC receiver. How do you build the trust between office holders so that any material disputes can be deferred or that uh, so that uh, a protocol can be arrived at or we'll talk about uh, a recent example soon where in fact the a, a foreign liquidation could even be carved out uh, how do you do that both 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 guests um, I think one of the things that that I, as the supervisor of the program, try to instill in the staff is, is an understanding of how foreign liquidations work. And in the typical case where the liquidators are independent professionals working um, for reputable firms with great experience and familiarity with their jurisdictions, um, I explain to the staff that the liquidators are not enemies. Um, for some weird reason, there is a natural skepticism of foreign liquidation proceedings um, uh, at the enforcement level. And an understandable concern that these proceedings, as has been done in domestic bankruptcy cases, can be used to conceal assets, to satisfy judgments, and to evade law enforcement. So my first goal um, when I see that a foreign insolvency proceeding has been commenced or will be commenced is to figure out who the liquidators are, who counsel is, and um, having satisfied myself that they are there for a legitimate purpose to have the staff interact directly with counsel and the liquidators to talk about the mutual goals of both of the proceedings. Now, I can't tell you I catch all the cases. I can't tell you um, that the staff comes to me in a timely fashion. Um, my, my hope and prayer is that, in fact, I catch these things early so that there's no acrimony um, and the lessons learned from prior cases, uh, the acrimony I have seen has arisen when, for example, uh, a number of years ago, we liquidated, uh, I'm sorry, we sued a foreign, a Cayman bank that had engaged in securities fraud and it had assets in the U.S. and we froze those assets and um, there was an initial conflict between the foreign Cayman liquidators and the enforcement staff over who should have control, which court should have control of the far of the frozen assets. And we ultimately reached a resolution where we released 24 million of the 25 million back to the Caymans to go back to what were basically commercial depositors in that bank and kept a million for a penalty in the United States. But my first goal is to try to get the staff comfortable with the foreign process and to reach out to the liquidators and their counsel. And generally, I can tell you um, my experiences in the last couple of years have been very positive. There's some very high profile cases that are problematic, but I think that's more the personalities involved than the process itself. Uh, my experience has been that um, liquidators are 
very willing to work with law enforcement to try to get the right result, um, even if their initial installation is was done under a cloud that caused the staff some concern. Um, and I've also noted that for as a general rule, the liquidators and the administrators and their law firms are extremely nice and pleasant and easy to work with. And that I believe has come as a surprise to some of the staff who may come in to these situations with a preconceived notion that the proceedings were filed to sort of evade um, the United States' jurisdiction. Hope that's helpful. Uh, very, I mean, very. Egal, is it intimidating to, to as a lay person, as a, as a private citizen working at NUI, you are now called into a, a meeting or maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you and your counsel are called into a meeting uh, with a, a regulatory body like the SEC. How do you, how do, what is your approach or what should be your approach and uh, how do you uh, persuade uh, Ms. Bombach's staff that this regime on under which you operate is is legitimate is you're doing your best you're an officer of the court what is what is the the, the methodology yeah no so to answer your first question of, of course it's it's uh it's a little nerve-wracking you know uh, the sec is is a pretty big organization within the united states we want to make sure to have uh aligned interests as much as possible sometimes you know there's certain deviations like i said earlier you, we, we try to push those to a later date but um before I go into um, you know what we typically do, I was going to um, mention to Alistair um, that case in Cayman you were talking about. I, I believe uh, we were the uh, we were the liquidators for that for that bank, and uh, <laughs> we, uh, we that was the first thing we did was we got we got on the plane, we flew to DC, and we, we met with the SEC, right? So, um, and this is basically a starting point for for the points I'm going to make. It's when the SEC is involved whether they're suing the entity over which you've been appointed as a, as a liquidator or receiver. I mean, one of the first phone calls we'll, we'll do is we'll call the SEC. You know, hopefully the protocols are fine and we can speak to them. If not, we can go through our local regulators, whether that's SEMA or the Bahamas Securities Commission. You know, we, we try sometimes to leverage on them. They have good relationships. I, I mentioned earlier about IOSCO, the exchange of information between, between the securities commissions globally. Um, so that's my first point of contact. Let's pick up the phone, develop a rapport. Hopefully, you know, it's people we've worked with in the past. If not, we try to develop a, a relationship. A lot of it is trust. A lot of it is trust and it's relationship and it's personalities, as Alistair had mentioned. And um, personally, what I like to do is I like to be well prepared for my meeting with the SEC, explain you know, what I can talk about that, that's that's open. And I can talk about the protocols, the goals we would like to achieve, how we would like to set up communication protocols, how we would like to report to one another, you know, what happens uh, with assets and where the assets are. And obviously our counsel, we, we typically would like to have our, our U.S. counsel involved in all, all of those conversations. But normally, uh, and in our past experience, specifically in this banking ex um, case that Alistair brought up, it, it went really well. And it was, a, it was highly publicized, very contentious matter, uh, and ultimately, I think the SEC and the foreign liquidator were able to at least work together in, in, in this particular case. A lot of a lot of that, the settlement, I, I believe, is some some of that is is we can't discuss unfortunately too much in detail, but uh, it, it it was resolved quite rapidly and seeming less uh, w without too many issues. But essentially, to recap, Warren, it's call as quickly as possible, uh, set up a proper structure. Um, to have communications with the, the uh, US SEC, um, understand where the pressure points are. Um, that it's good to talk about the pressure points. It's good to understand where the pressure points are from both the SEC and the foreign uh, liquidator. Have an agreement that those those uh, possible pressure points will be dealt with at a later point in time, so that we can focus on align on our interest and essentially wrapping our hands around the assets globally, wherever wherever they may be. Perfect. I, I think that I, 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 I will note this this importance of, of credibility and personality, because I think just like when 
a client asks me as a lawyer, what's the value of this case? What is this case? The fact is, as between different people, you can have drastically different outcomes under the same set of facts. It matters who, it matters what strategies your lawyers adopts, it matters how the judge views the case. You, different judges can view the cases in different ways. From what I've seen, and, and we've been involved, I, I think the Holland and Knight has been appointed as SEC receivers in various instances, including on the Bitcoin front. We've also represented, of course, quite a lot of foreign liquidators. We've seen uh, both sides. And what I find very interesting is that it really does matter who is involved and, and what level of trust um, is at issue. Let, let me ask this and let me turn, because I'm seeing we have about 15 minutes left. Let me turn to one of the more uh, interesting issues, and I'm going to put up the solu one solution that I believe Ms. Bombach's office found right away, which is, here's the contentious issue. Uh, in the United States, and we have talked about this on a series of our asset recovery panels, there is a view, a reasonable view, a view that a rational lawyer could take that in certain respects, the jurisdiction of the United States courts and by extension court officers extend beyond the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. This is an interesting phenomenon. It has implications for non-SEC injunctions. So for example, victims, creditor victims, investor victims can often obtain, we, we espouse the utility of the concept of an extraterritorial injunction. What we see from bankruptcy courts is that there's almost a merger of the concept of personal jurisdiction and, and the race. Bankruptcy courts, of course, have jurisdiction over an entity's assets. But what does it mean when those assets are outside the United States or under someone else's control? How do you go from having jurisdiction over an asset to jurisdiction over the person? The reason I mention these is that uh, there are two cases since I think the last major offshore alert conference that have come out in inappropriate matters, one in the Allen Stanford matter, one in the in the Madoff matter. And in the Madoff matter, uh, what I will say very briefly is that it has been determined by under under the, by the New York the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and there's no there's no Supreme Court track on this particular horizon. It's been it's been uh, cert has been denied that the provisions of the bankruptcy code, and by the way, add by extension to those powers of SIPA trustees and all the sorts of regulatory agencies that are involved. Uh, are that fraudulent conveyances that originate from a United States bank account can be pursued through non-immediate transferees offshore. The last part is not so controversial. The first part, though, is because the concept is there could be a transaction from a U.S. entity, a U.S. fund, and, and, and just consider a run-of-the-mill U.S. fund, which goes to an offshore fund and then goes to a bad actor. Everyone agrees that the bad actor is a bad actor. The SEC agrees. You agree, uh, Egal. Both of you would then, under this ruling, of course, Bahamas would be naturally, there's, a, there's a, a, a transfer out of your estate, which is subject to clawback, and an SEC receiver or, or trustee, a bankruptcy trustee, uh, who's it's been converted to a bankruptcy, would have the ability to go after that same transfer. How do you deal with that conflict? How do you deal with that situation? Let me, can you hear me, Warren? I'm sorry, yes. I'm getting, okay, sorry. Let me, let me step back one question and just address the first part of your, your comment so you know kind of where we're coming from as an agency or where I'm coming from since these are my own views and don't represent the agency's views. But there's a Supreme Court case called Morrison that talks about the, the extraterritorial extraterritorial jurisdiction of the United States and how the Securities and Exchange Commission gets jurisdiction in securities fraud cases. So, for example, um, there's a very famous case called Amarindo, which um, involved um, a massive investment 
uh, fraud through a financial advisor, very prominent financial advisor, numerous and many, many overseas um, victims. And for the commission to first get jurisdiction, the court, the court in Morris, the, the, the Supreme Court had held that you look at the locus of the transaction. So in other words, where did the sale of securities take place? And as you can imagine, that's going to be a multi-pronged factual analysis. Mm -hmm. But what typically would happen to bring you into made, the world of Madoff and these other cases is you look initially at where the securities were sold. At that point, if you can establish that the initial um, sale of securities or substantial steps on the way to consummating the sale occurred in the United States, then the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission has jurisdiction to pursue those defendants, return money to those foreign victims and bring those claims. So if you have that um, as the overlap for your first um, comment, which was the comment about there is a you know reason of view that the the government can in fact um, you know bring recover assets in foreign jurisdictions and so forth, or their fiduciaries can. I think you start with the basic jurisdiction to enforce the law. Then the second thing becomes the ancillary relief attached to that, namely the appointment of a receiver or perhaps a companion bankruptcy case. Um, at which point, um, I guess it's consistent with the view in the Morrison case that <clears throat> it, the court will look at the initial transfer and look to see if it was trans if if it was fraudulent in the as a result the the first transfer or um, what was their intent. So you look to decide whether there's jurisdiction. You look again, like in the Morrison situation at the initial uh, transfer and what its intent was at the time, and then the subsequent transfers and things that happened down the line are not as relevant for legal analysis. They're obviously relevant to the extent that you get to the second part of your question, which is who goes after them and who has the better tools to do it. But for the purpose of this conversation, let's assume that we all have the ability legally to bring the claim and what do you do about it? Um, so my analysis in these complex cases would be to try to figure out the best way to get the victim money back. So I'd start on the back end and mm -hmm. I'd say, and I'd say, who are the victims? For example, in a feeder fund situation, where's the money going to go? Is it going to go to the fund? Is the fund going to use it to do additional investing? Are they going to, are they going to give it to victims? Are they going to use it to pay, uh, lawsuits, how, you know, what are the considerations? My major goal is to get it to the victims. Um, so if there's a way to negotiate with those foreign liquidators and get some kind of a representation or an agreement that some or substantial portion of those funds would go to victims, then I am absolutely uh, would recommend to the staff that they not have the fiduciary if we have control over the fiduciary or obviously we don't have control, but we have the ability to work with them and and uh, express our views. We, we might say, for example, it's most efficient to allow the Cayman liquidator to go after transfers out of the feeder funds because they have uh, their case laws the best, their recovery uh, their ability to seize assets and to um, execute on judgments is um, more well honed. And so for that category of claims, they should do it. For a category of claims over, say, for example, a registrant, a multinational with a substantial locus a connection to the United States, it may make more sense for the United States fiduciary to do it. So my preference is to sit down, look at the universe, figure out where the victims are and figure out how best to cut up the pie to get the money back to them. Um, it's very difficult, no matter what these cases suggest, it's not easy for a US regulator um, 
or even a, certainly not for a U.S. regulator, but it's not easy for a U.S. fiduciary, either a receiver or a bankruptcy trustee to actually collect judgments um, extraterritorially. So I am looking for the most efficient way to do that. Now, Egal, I think that's that, that's very fair. Now, Egal, I think that the most important word in that sentence was victim. And uh, setting aside, because I think everybody knows that that for for reputable firms, people trying their best, there has to be a compensation system, you know, for legal fees for times time spent that's reasonable. But setting aside that, isn't the issue? Isn't one issue that you, as a liquidator, the goal is to pay creditors? Are creditors synonymous with victims. I'll start with Egal because I think this is this is a very important point. Well, yeah, it, it depends on the case, Warren. But but many times, many times it is. Many times and in, in what we've seen in, in a lot of public cases, you know, creditors slash investors, right? Because especially a, a lot of what we're talking about, a lot of funds here in this region, um, creditors and victims and investors are at the same pool. I'm just going to close my door. I'm sorry. No, no problem at all. And and by the way, to 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 hone Ms. Bombach's point just a little further, I would refer the audience, if, if they're watching, to the case of Jarvey versus Proskauer Rose, where you will see the, the how some of these issues played out. And the fact is, in that particular matter, there was found to be no personal jurisdiction over the liquidator. So many, what we're really talking about here is practicality, because if you're in a situation where you're having to enforce things, it's always tough. It's also bad for a relationship. Uh, so sorry, I'll continue. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess where, where it becomes interesting and becomes tricky is where there is a U.S. SEC, there is a U.S. appointee, whether that's a bankruptcy trustee or a receiver, there is an offshore liquidator and there is assets in both jurisdiction or, or even there's assets on only one of the jurisdictions. Then what happens? So, you know, if, if the cash is all sitting in the U.S. and it got frozen in the U.S. with the investment manager or, or whatnot, you have a, an office holder in Cayman or in the Bahamas that basically is appointed over a company, an LP, et cetera, which has no assets or which has assets, excuse me, but the cash is, is, is in the U.S. And then you have uh, the U.S. Um, representative that has taken possession of the assets. That's where it gets a little dicey and it gets more difficult to manage because then there's a determination. Of, so, so what happens with those funds? Should they be coming back to Cayman? Should they stay in the U.S.? And that's where I think a lot of the relationship and the trust needs to be built between the parties to be able to uh, look at all the facts, look at all the precedents and, and understand or, or work together uh, to essentially for those funds to go back to the victims as we as we originally said. There are certain um, cases that we've seen in the past where there has been um, there has been a U.S. foreign uh, receiver or bankruptcy trustee, which has taken a joint appointment with a, you know, offshore liquidator. It, it does happen. It's happened in BC Capital in the Bahamas. It's happened with the Canadian regular, regulator and tri-global pension fund. And I think it happened in Cayman with direct lending as well. So, so you see that happen. That's one, I guess, one of the mechanisms that you can, you can ultimately uh, look at should there be a major impasse uh, between between the parties, but uh, the trickiest situation is, you know, possessions nine tenths of the law. Where is the where is the money? Where are the assets? Who is taking possession of them? And then, uh, you know, it becomes it becomes a challenging situation because, as you mentioned about, you know, payment of legal fees, uh, payment of liquidator fees, etc. There has to be alignment between uh, the U.S. representative and the offshore representative so that the liquidation can work. Or else you're going to be at a roadblock. You, you, no, I've been accused of being intense, but I agree. It's about being cool headed. Uh, the question is, how are you going to react? You know, is is there going to be a rationality to the discussion that that if possession is nine tenths of the law, either the liquidators or the receiver are going to be on one end of the stick or the other in every case, right? And so if you take crazy positions, then that can always bite, you know, maybe not in that case, but that can come back to bite you later. 
Um, and, and, and of course, people need to be able to properly, you know, state an argument, defend themselves, conduct legal research, and pay someone to do it. In fact, uh, unlike the United States, as I understand it, most attorneys and liquidators can't even work on a what's called a contingency basis. So there, there, there's real concerns. Uh, what I'd like to do in the last few seconds is we did find a, a, there, there may be a solution that was uh, Ms. Bombach's team prepared, which is at least in, in one case in which I'm involved, which is called Platinum, when there was an SEC receivership, the Cayman liquidation was expressly carved out of the receivership order. I had never seen that before. And is that a, a, some sort of a model or solution that can be used again? Let's closing comments, please, because we're out of time and then uh, I'll answer your question. Um. I certainly hope so. I mean, I authored that solution. I looked at the facts, looked at the capital structure of the various platinum entities and thought that the best thing to do was to allow the fiduciaries to work simultaneously, cooperatively, and we would resolve our mutual issues at the end, which is what we did. I think that can work, but I do think you have to do, the regulators, at least my team and and Egal, your team too, you have to sit down and do an analysis from both sides of what the interests are and who will get paid, um, under which jurisdiction, what kind of claims there are back and forth, and whether and, and whether that approach works. It's going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but as a practical matter, um, the jurisdiction of a U.S. receiver um, over foreign assets um, is complicated. So I'm certainly hopeful that the model that we used in Platinum can be tweaked and used in future matters. Egal, we are closing out now. So 15 seconds. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree with Alistair. I think um, you certainly, us as, as liquidator, we, you know, we view the SEC uh, in the highest uh, regards and respects, and we always want to find an alignment with them find not finding an alignment is actually tip, not typical at all so we uh, we always want to work together and yeah platinum is, is a great is a great situation i hope we can um see those decisions again both of you thank you so much for joining this panel today david martian thank you for all of the work that it took to put this program and this session together we look forward to doing this live i, I hope very soon um, and thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to our investigative news and documents service and attending our events. For more information, visit offshorealert.com.